Hi everyone, today I'm at the front of my studio and I thought instead of doing a makeup look or a tutorial, I would talk through a few more things in my vintage makeup collection. I have done videos in the past about it. Um, I think I did my first one about 10 years ago called something like vintage makeup, I love it. At the time, there was definitely a big thing for collecting powder compacts and perfume bottles, but the collection of old lipsticks, old blush, old mascaras and things like that was a little bit niche. <laughs> so I was quite worried when I put my first video up that everyone would just think I was a total weirdo. But luckily no one thought that and people were very interested, as interested as I am. So since then I've dropped a few pieces in here and there, but I think my collection is just so huge. There are probably hundreds and hundreds, not a thousand pieces that I thought any video I make is going to be five hours long. But what I've done today is I've just chosen about 50 pieces that I personally think are very interesting and I thought I'd just talk you through those today. So I'm going to start by putting on my gloves. I'm going to start with my oldest piece and this is a powder compact that is over a thousand years old. And this is from the Chinese Northern Song Dynasty era. And the pot itself is very typical of the time. I love the Celadon glaze, which gives it this wonderful bluey green color. And inside it has remnants of white lead pigment. And that would have been used as a face powder, a very toxic face powder, but a face powder nonetheless. So jumping forward a bit, this is around 1890. I've always been interested in old theatrical brands because they were really the bridge between, or one of the bridges between makeup becoming commercialized and becoming very acceptable amongst the general public. The brands like Stein and Leishner were mainly just used by actors. And although no one else would be caught dead, or particularly if you were a, um, a genteel, from a genteel family, the, the idea that you would wear makeup would be very much frowned upon. A lot of these theatrical brands were really at the forefront of that commercialization. I love this tin, which is from about 1890, of Stein face powder. And this is a big tin of loose powder, which would have sat in a theater makeup department. Because powder was one of the few cosmetic items that was acceptable, it's interesting how they've marketed this for the stage but have also written on the tin for the boudoir as well. So you can see this transition from the theatre into people's homes, albeit in a quite racy way. Leishner, I love, love, love Leishner products. They were definitely only for theatricals, but they began to be purchased by women that maybe wanted to buy makeup and use it sort of covertly. And they made incredible blushes. Look at this, look at this colour. It's so vivid, pink. So beautiful. Jumping forward a little bit to around 1900, this is one of my favorite pieces. I've mentioned it before. Um, it's made by Potter and Moore, who were a very big toiletry company during the Victorian era. They specialized in making soaps and face powders and definitely not color cosmetics, but all of those sort of nice scented waters and toilet waters and things like that, very often with lavender in, which was very, very popular at the time. Now this is a little pot of powder, but whoever owned this must have decided to customize it with a ceramic rose, which just makes it so much more personal and special. It still has the powder in, it still smells of lavender quite strongly. And I just think it's, for me, it's what fascinates me about vintage makeup, that it's really a bridge into the past. It really is connecting with somebody's life. You know, somebody made this rose, put it on top, sat it on their dressing table, and it must have given so much pleasure. And I just think it's, it's just a really unique piece. Something that's really fun is this little pot of velvet mouche and these are face patches, so made of velvet. Mouche were really popular in the 18th century and they were often made of all different fabrics, leather and taffeta and, and velvet in different shapes and they would signify different things depending on where you placed your patches. They were also used back then to, in the 18th century to cover blemishes and spots and smallpox scars. 
it was strange, but they suddenly came back in fashion around the turn of the century until sort of 1920. And they were just an affectation. They were very much picked up by aristocrats that wanted to be flamboyant and, and, and wear them to go out in the evening and very much so for fancy dress parties as well. So that's more like a trend item. I love all of these blush. You've seen the sort of beginning of the commercialization of makeup here. So this is around 1910, 1911, 1914. It was still frowned upon definitely to wear makeup then, but these are made by local chemists and toiletry companies. So they're obviously aiming them at the general public, um, but they still would have been something that you maybe would have sent away for. If you look in very early Vogues, you'll see in the back pages, there are little messages saying pink cheeks, send us a stamped address envelope and we will return your blush in a brown envelope. So you can imagine, you know, you didn't want to be seen to be wearing blush or indeed to be going into a shop and openly asking for it. So this is one from New York and um, this company was called Oxin and they started around 1880. And this blush, I believe, is from about 1910. Really beautiful rosy pink colour. Again, this is around 1914, the Venus Rouge from Denver. Absolutely love this pot. It inspired the packaging for my rings that I sell and as did the puff. I, I, I managed to recreate this puff um, because I just love it so much. This has lost its color. It looks like a pale lavender. There's no way back then it would have been made that color because they didn't have the, the pigments to make something that subtle. It would have been probably a lot brighter, but it has faded. And then here's a French version. I can't open this. It has a beautiful puff in, but the powder will go everywhere. So I really like these. I think it's just their ordinariness that I like. I'm going to go on to mascara now and 1916, 1917. I'm going to start with this, which is more of a eyelash treatment. So a bit like I've been using new lash. This would have been the new lash of its day. And um, I just love the instructions on the back and I'm going to have to put find my glasses because the writing is tiny. Um, so this is a company called eyelash line. So it's a little bit like um, the Maybelline, the, the names are quite similar. So this was when retiring, bathe the eyelids in warm water for about 10 minutes. Can you imagine? That's, that's a long nighttime routine using a soft cloth or sponge and then dry thoroughly and apply eyelash line to the edges of the eyelids with the fingertip, rub and massage the eyelids gently at the same time. And this was 50 cents. So moving on from the eyelash treatment, I'm gonna go on to mascara, actual mascara. This is cake mascara. And this is the Maybelline one, which launched in 1917. And exactly the same year, Rimmel launched his cake mascara. So it's debatable as to who launched it first. Certainly Rimmel had been already in the game for quite a long time. In 1860, he had launched his mascara, which was mainly used by actors and also gentlemen to sort of touch up their moustaches and touch up their sideburns and their grey and things like that. So he was already in the mascara game, but maybe the first commercial one was Maybelline. We'll, we will never really know. What I love about this is how tiny it is. I mean. It's almost like you had to have very small hands if you wanted to do a good job of your mascara. You can see how dinky that is. The brush is absolutely tiny. The idea is that you spit onto the cake and then you would rub on there and then apply it to your eyelashes. Coming into the 1920s now and the makeup industry is really hotting up. There is so much interest in makeup because of Hollywood and because of the silent movies and all of the fanzines for the movies were very much encouraging get the looks, get the hairstyle, get the makeup. And for the first time, people like Max Factor are selling what would have been originally makeup for theatre and makeup for use in movies. They're starting to sell it to the general public and there is a real acceptance of it. It happens a little bit earlier in the States than it did in the UK, although. I think people were definitely wearing makeup, but when I went through all of the Vogues and went through all of the archives, I noticed that 
it wasn't until 1924 that there's an article saying that makeup is okay to use for, for regular people, but it's happening quite a bit earlier in the state. So you're seeing lots of incredible pieces coming out. I think my all time favorite Maybelline product is this one from the 1920s. And they made two eyeshadows like this. The colors are incredible. I hope I can get the lid off yet. Look at that. There's a blue and a green. I mean, it's insane, the color. Doesn't smell too bad at all. And it's just so dinky. Everything was tiny because all of the advertising is about being dainty and being very cute and um, everything's sort of miniaturized almost. This is one of the earliest Max Factor. This is a lip treatment or a lip gloss really. So this would have, he would have sold this out of one of his first shops. He was still selling theatrical makeup. So he's actually still selling the Stein powder and all the Leishner stuff, but he was also really starting to work as the chemist with a lot of the movie makeup artists, the Westmores particularly, and creating makeup for movies. But regular women wanted to get that look. So something like this would have been an easy way to sort of get the look of your favorite actress. There's lots of really beautiful packaging around this time. This was actually made in Warsaw. I think I was initially attracted to it because of the decorative aesthetic, which is so typical of the period. So I'm going to skip a few pieces now because I'm aware that this is going to be quite a long video. I'm going to jump to this. This is a beautiful piece, so rare from the 1920s. I've only ever seen one and this is it. Um, this was made by Dunhill and Dunhill uh, a men's tailors were very fashionable around this era and fashionable men that would buy suits there and tailoring would also buy their silver lighters and if you whipped out a silver Dunhill lighter it was a very cool thing to do and light your cigarette and then for their very top clients they made a limited edition version of the lighter that looks like a lighter but it's actually a makeup compendium so it's got everything you need for a night out it's got a face powder in the front. It's got a black coal pencil, a beautiful coal pencil. It's never been used. Look at that, amazing. Um, a bottle of perfume, blush and red lipstick. I think that's really, really cool. So moving on to the 1930s, and this is a really nice period of lipstick glamour because lipstick is now available everywhere, you can buy it cheaply, you don't have to, you can walk into a store, you can walk into say Woolworths and just buy it and it's just hanging there. And this is a really nice example of a lipstick. This is the Woodbury lipstick and it says 10 cents. So it was a dime to go into Woolworths, pick this off the shelf and just buy it. There was no shame in wearing lipstick anymore. A beautiful lipstick from this era, probably my favorite Art Deco lipstick is this Helena Rubinstein one. It just has the most incredible mechanism and it's a really beautiful example of Art Deco design and it has an amazing red lipstick inside. Love that. This is a jolly little Art Deco piece. Beautiful design. It's a blush sample by Tanji who are a huge huge cosmetic brand at the time and inside you can see the puff and the surprisingly bright blush. They also made these really cute little samples and these were just puffs in a little bag and it says on it this sample consists of a felt disc sufficiently impregnated with the rouge to demonstrate its marvellous colour effects. Something that's very rare and I'm really lucky to have is this Westmore little compact and this was a gift to all the celebrities the night that the House of Westmore opened. I won't go into the House of Westmore but I wrote about them extensively in my book Face Paint um, and they were really the kind of kings of Hollywood makeup and I was given this by Christiana who's the great granddaughter of one of the original makeup artists, the original Westmore brothers. This represents a real turning point for the brothers because it signifies then moving from makeup artists into having their own consumer and salon makeup line. So that's an incredible piece. A piece that I really love are these ITEB strip eyelashes from the 1930s. I love the graphics. 
I love the illustration. It looks very 1930s. But the thing that I love most is how nicely these have been cared for. And these eyelashes have obviously been worn so many times and taken off carefully and preserved. The glue's empty, but the glue's been kept in the box. And I just think about this girl, this person that bought this. They weren't that expensive, but this is... For them, this was glamour. This was something which was really treasured. This is like a dream to have these eyelashes and to wear these eyelashes. And I always think about what happened to this person when they were wearing these eyelashes. Did they have like some incredible night out and maybe they were proposed to or something. So sometimes I think about the vintage makeup in those terms. And I really try to connect with the lives of the women. This company also made, if you look at the advertising, individual lashes, and they were the, one of the first companies to launch individual lashes that you could apply yourself and, and, and use yourself. So just like exactly like the ones we use today. This is quite an interesting piece. It's a mascara from 1937, but it's quite unusual in the format and the delivery system because at that time, most women would be using mascaras like this. So in the, the block with the brush. Spit and polish, spit and brush as they used to call them. The advertising claimed it stayed clean and ladylike until all used up. And I think the use of the word ladylike is a reference to the fact that you didn't have to spit anymore. So it really is quite an extraordinary piece. So this next piece is fascinating because it really illustrates the link between science and beauty. It's just so fascinating to me that the beauty industry was, and to a certain extent still is, drawn to this outrageous marketing, often using pseudo and quasi-science when trying to sell the dream of beauty. This is a particularly extraordinary makeup brand which was called Throw Radio. There was actually two makeup brands similar to this, a French one and a British one at the time. This is the French one. And it was makeup, radioactive makeup really. It was makeup that contained radium and radium had been discovered at the end of the 19th century and was being touted as a cure-all, as being a healthy thing. So it was being added to lots of different things and the makeup industry thought, oh, great, we'll add it to makeup and we'll add it to lipsticks and, and face creams. And, and the ads, I particularly love the ads for this brand. They had this incredible 1930s style illustration of this woman who looks like she's glowing from below and it sort of says glow glow from within with our incredible radium infused lipsticks um, luckily no one died of it because radium was incredibly expensive so it was more of what we call these days a marketing level of the ingredient which means hardly any it was just they put the tiniest amount in so they were able to really market the product as being containing radium another beautiful thing although horrific really and these were so popular in the 1920s and 30s and I have lots of them although it's it's you know a monstrosity really but swan down puffs were absolutely huge and every woman had some kind of a swan down puff and you would use it to often with a baker light handle like this or even um, a crystal handle and you would use it to dust on your your face powder, maybe your radioactive face powder, you would dust it on. This is a beautiful, beautiful piece. And this is my favorite collab of all time. And this was after the 1934 movie Zuzu, which had starred Josephine Baker. This legendary Art Deco style cuff bracelet with hidden powder compact was a licensing deal with Albert Flamand, a Parisian jewellery company. While you were out dancing, you would take your puff out and powder your face. And in the advertising, there was three different bangles. There was this black and silver one. I think there's a gold and green one and another one that was quite colorful. And all of the advertising had Josephine Baker's signature. So to me, that's the chicest makeup collab of all time. So we're coming to the end of the 1930s. And around this time, you can find so many beautiful 
powder boxes, cardboard powder boxes, but decorated incredibly well. This one is probably the most famous. It's the Coty Airspun Powder with a package designed by celebrated artist and theatre designer Leon Baxt, most famous for his work with the Ballet Russe. This one is by Longcom again, a really beautiful box. Longcom started with fragrances and then moved into powder. Lots of perfume houses actually at this time were starting to get into makeup. Um, certainly Chanel. If you look at, um, this is a wartime pack for Chanel. So it, it, it says on it wartime packaging underneath because things like puffs were in short supply and lots of the materials that were needed to create these incredible boxes just weren't available anymore. When you look at this, this is Coty Airspun, but from during the war, and it says wartime edition. So they went from this at the end of the 30s to this. And although makeup packaging was certainly being downgraded during the Second World War, makeup was really being pushed as a patriotic thing. It was almost your duty to wear makeup. Elizabeth Arden launched Patriotic Red. Lots of the adverts for Helena Rubenstein are about put your war face on, don't let standards slip, keep your makeup on. So um, makeup was definitely still there in a big way, although the packaging was maybe a lot more simple. This compact represents a rare example of makeup and politics colliding. This was used to promote Roosevelt during the 1940 American election. And this was seen as a way to recruit women voters by making powder compacts and by circulating them and having women you know touching up their their makeup and promoting a candidate so coming back from the war the next pieces that I'm going to talk about really for me sum up how makeup almost becomes like a performance by the late 40s and into the 50s all of these pieces I have are European and American and they're really telling a story to me of what women are supposed to be doing in their lives because lots of women had worked during the war. They'd been in the armed forces, they'd had jobs, they'd earned money, but they were kind of expected to go back into the kitchen and become the homemakers and the mothers again. And there is this kind of uber femininity that comes through in all of the pieces around this period. Everything is so over the top and really lends itself to kind of making yourself up in public and doing your lipstick and your powder and it, it's almost like a they're almost like performance pieces from this period I really love this lipstick which is Rouge Brise which is a French company and they just made I think the most seductive lipstick ever this is a nice piece from the about 1947 so a couple of years after the war ended this was called the gay 90s mitt because <laughs> as a reference to the 1890s and the Belle Epoque. So this was a sort of Edwardian piece that was quite fashionable again um, in the 1940s. This is a great piece by Guerlain that I love because I don't really have many pieces by Guerlain from the 1940s. So it's just a very beautiful powder compact. So I'm gonna move on to the 1950s now. And this is all about novelty, novelty compacts. First one I'm gonna talk about is this because this was the ultimate status symbol and it was a powder compact made by BOAC which were sort of British Airways before it was British Airways and you could buy this on board the plane so if you own this you would be telling people that you were so glamorous because you could afford to get on an aeroplane and travel which in the 1950s was uber uber glamorous so anything to do with travel is so popular at this time. This was a very famous powder compact by Pygmalion, a company called Pygmalion, and this was a musical globe. So again, there's this idea that glamour, travel and glamour are so interlinked. Also space, people are starting to think about space and travel and rockets and astronauts and what can the possibilities be. So there are lots of sort of spacey looking or planets and things like that coming through. This is considered by a lot of people who collect vintage makeup as being the kind of holy grail. It's where art and performance and makeup meet or shall I say decoration and design meet. It's by Salvador Dali and it's the 
Bird in the Hand Compact. The bird's head is a, a red lipstick and the back is the powder compact and it's signed by Dali. And this was produced, it was a licensing deal with a company called Elgin in America. And I think there was lots of doubt in recent years as to whether Dali had had anything to do with it, but there's lots of evidence that um, someone who was actually in the meetings originally, um, their niece wrote a piece on how she'd heard from her uncle that when he'd gone to the meeting with Dali that he'd presented several different designs for the compact and one of them had in fact been exactly this bird. So we think that this was actually designed by Dali and Dali had a really strong link with um, designing lots of products. He was a real kind of pioneer when it came to licensing deals. So this would have been one of the first ones in the 50s. And then you also have the Mae West sofa, the Mae West lips. You might have seen the red lip sofa. Um, they now make it in several different colors. You can still buy that today. And then in the 80s, he did a licensing deal to do lipsticks, which you can still find them on eBay. They're kind of red or black lips. Um, they're sort of like lucite, like a clear plastic. And then in 1994, sorry, I'm jumping ahead to the 90s here, there is this gold lips collection, which was launched by the estate after his death. I've already made a tutorial about this piece, but I thought I'd just show it again quickly. And this was a lipstick holder made by Cartier for Audrey Hepburn. And this is what she had in her handbag all throughout the 50s and the 60s. I bought it at auction a few years ago, and I have actually made a video just about this piece because it's so iconic. So I'll link to the video for that. Another fascinating lipstick holder is this one I own by Dior and Dior launched lipsticks in 1953. Initially, these were given to the clients of the Couture Atelier in Paris, but eventually they were available to buy. And they came in two formats. There was the quite simple gold ridged version, and this would be for your handbag and for use during the day. And then there's this incredibly ornate crystal obelisk that you would have on your dressing table and every time you would get your new lipstick, you would put in there and then you would apply this one at home and leave the house with this one. Some more interesting lipsticks from the 1950s, either because of color or because of the way they were put together, are these ones. I think everyone probably agrees this is one of the most iconic colors ever, which is Arden Pink by Elizabeth Arden. It was Jackie Kennedy's favorite color I have a really good condition one here. Um, in fact, slightly morbid, but she was wearing this the day of the assassination. We only know that because all of her clothes that she was wearing that day, her Chanel suit and all of her belongings were packed up the next day and it included a tube of Elizabeth Arden's Arden Pink. This is Revlon's Fire and Ice, which is an iconic red lipstick. It was also iconic because of the advertising, which was written by a woman, interestingly. And the way they sold Fire and Ice was to give women the idea that it's not just about the color and the makeup, but it's about the desirability that you will get from particular colors or particular makeup. And this, the woman that wore fire and ice was described as the most fascinating woman in the world or something like that. It was just something which was quite unique. And I think having a female copywriter certainly added an extra layer and it worked. It was one of the most successful colors of all time. Interesting because of the technology are the Hazel Bishop lipstick, which had launched in the 40s. This is a 50s example. And this was one of the first long wearing lipsticks. I did forget to mention that, that was actually the first long wearing lipstick. And this was a technology that was coming in using bromo acids to create a more waterproof and more indelible lipstick. And although the Rouge Brazier one was, was very famous, Hazel Bishop became so popular because she really utilized the medium of television and she would often have ads in the middle of really popular TV shows. And this led to sales in the millions. And although I think it's probably one of the most drying lipsticks ever, 
and probably quite irritating as well. It certainly lasted a long time on the lips. Another interesting formula was Helena Rubinstein's waterproof lipstick. And this was heavily advertised everywhere. So you could drink in it, you can swim in it, you can eat in it. And I particularly like this one because it's a miniature sample and it's quite unusual to see, or you hadn't really seen in the past, something that was as good quality as the full size version in miniature. So this is a really exquisite example of an early sample. So onto a really iconic piece of makeup history. And this is the first wand style mascara. And I think because all mascaras now are wand style and we think they've been around forever. This was quite late. It was 1957 that it launched and it was a metal wand with a metal, not really a brush, but you recognize this style today. And it was advertised as a brush free mascara, but it was something that I think if you think about it up until then, mascara has either been, I have a, a previous one, one before then from Helena Rubenstein, had been a tube with a brush or it had been the cake style or it had been like we saw in the 1930s, one that you'd have to wet and you'd have to pick it up with a brush. So to have something that was considered automatic as this was, where you could just dip in and, and put it on your lashes was quite revolutionary. And this had actually been patented in 1939, something very similar to this by someone called Frank Engel. And I don't know, maybe he didn't have enough money to launch it. Maybe, I don't know, he went out of business, but shortly after his patent expired, Helena Rubenstein came up with this. So hashtag just saying, don't know if they saw his patent and thought we'll wait till it expires and launch it or whether they'd already been working on it. But that's a really, really iconic piece of history. Early 60s makeup looks like it almost fit into the 50s. And this is normal because things go in cycles, but they don't finish at the end of the decade. So this mood that we had of everything being gold and flashy and quite blingy that started in the late 40s, continues a little bit into the very early 60s and you're still seeing things which are very novelty and very blingy. Take for example this lipstick holder by Charles Revson and he had also launched this year a collection of lipstick holders which were called the Couturines and they were all these elegantly dressed women but this was just so on the money because he'd seen that there was a real appetite for the film Cleopatra, even though it wasn't out yet. Everyone had seen Elizabeth Taylor out for dinner in Rome with Richard Burton and wearing all the makeup and the paparazzi had gone wild and it was in all of the magazines. So before the film even came out, he had released his Cleopatra lipstick holder. And I really love this ad as well. So by the mid sixties, makeup, fashionable makeup looks totally different. It's all about plastic packaging, very childlike looking illustrations, bright colors. It's very naive in a way. It's a real reaction to all of this gold and bling and young girls that are getting into makeup. They just don't want to look like their mothers. They don't want to have their compacts and be doing their makeup in public like their grannies and, and mothers. So makeup becomes very playful. Um, I've got lots and lots of pieces from this era because it's so exciting in a way to see that real sea change and that real revolution. This is quite an interesting product. Oh, I can smell that already. Hmm, interesting. This is the Mary Quant highlight and contour. So you've got your contouring powder and your highlight there. It looks very ashy and gray. I don't know if it looked like that, it might've just gone off. Um, but that's something that almost feels like modern day makeup. Very playful eyeshadows that almost look like pieces of Lego that you unscrew and you've got your eyeshadow in there and a mirror here. And it's all, it's all about fingers and applying your makeup in quite a painterly and artistic way. I can imagine a lot of these product names must have been deemed really risque by the older generation, which I guess made them even more fun. Things like Starkers and In the Nude. I do have all the crayons as well. I haven't used them today because I've, I've talked about them in the past. Going into the 70s, everything just becomes really fun, really plasticky or really natural. 
there's this movement into organic and natural makeup. Um, lots of the Mary Quant makeup at that time became all about looking healthy and healthy glow and natural and freckly and, and show your freckles. Um, and there was also this just, you know, I just love all of the Avon stuff from the 70s. I love these lipsticks. I mean, they're just like <laughs> so bonkers. <laughs> So you've got your kind of gelato there, your ice cream, a pencil, lipstick, everything's so plasticky and childlike and could practically be in a nursery. A Coke bottle lipstick. This is a quite a cool thing. This is an eyeshadow. It's got love on, so it's very much a 70s vibe then. It's just a plastic eyeball and inside it's got your eyeshadow and a mirror. I think one of the most kitsch things I own from the 70s is this Birdhouse by Max Factor. And this was released in time for the holiday season in 1973. And it had what they described as continental size lipstick. So I think they mean like a travel size of lipstick. And you get this little bird in here and it came in an enormous box, a huge great big box. It was obviously meant to be a teenager's Christmas present. Interestingly enough, it was all on sale by February, so I don't think it went down that well. I'm gonna stop in the 80s, and I thought, what should I feature from the 80s? And I definitely have a lot of really, what I'd consider iconic pieces from there, but I've decided not to feature the most iconic, but to feature the rarest thing that I have. Probably because I reckon I'm the only person that has this makeup range. It's the, I'll just, bring a couple of pieces out. It's the Barbara Hulaniki makeup collection. And this was Barbara Hulaniki who had been the founder of Bieber and she'd launched the boutiques in London in the 60s. She'd launched the makeup range in the 70s, which was so revolutionary. And I'm lucky enough to own the whole range and the shop fittings and the whole thing. I'm, I'm obsessed with it. Um, the makeup range was so interesting for me and I've done some videos with it before because it was great colours, it was really something different, it was makeup for all skin tones, it was just, she was really ahead of her time in that respect and um, unfortunately the whole corporate thing had taken over and she'd sold to a big corporation that really ran the company down and ran the makeup down. So in 1980, once she got out of that, she launched her own range and I just think it's, the packaging is phenomenal. All of the colors are so interesting and lots of them you wouldn't be able to make today. Say for example, this eyeshadow, which is radium actually, it's called Day Glow Pink. When I look at the ingredients list, I think there's lakes and things that probably, well, I know for a fact, are banned in lots of countries now. Um, loads of coloured mascaras, so really sums up that 80s mood, blue mascaras, really almost fluorescent blues and purples and great, great names for all of the products. Wow, that's... <laughs> that stinks. Ooh. Um, but yeah, that's just for me a really personal thing and I was gifted that by... Barbara because I lent my collection of Bieber makeup when she had a retrospective, I lent it to a museum. So as a kind of thank you, I was given the makeup range from the 80s. So as something that I'm very proud of in my collection and I know is probably quite hard to get hold of, I feel that that is for me really iconic. So that's it, just a few pieces from my collection and Maybe one day I'll have a museum show or something that I can show it all off. But until then, I'm going to have to pack it all up now and it's all got to go back in the vault. So probably not going to see it for a while. I've really enjoyed today. I have absolutely loved collecting vintage makeup because every time I see it, it just inspires me. Not just the colours and the packaging, it's the social history, the chemistry, the textures, everything. I just... I really, really find it fascinating. So I hope you've enjoyed this video. And if you want to read more about vintage makeup or you just want to know more about the history of makeup, you can check out my book, Face Paint, which has not only more photographs of this collection, but also a lot more about the history. So do let me know in the comments which was your favorite piece today and or which was your favorite era. 
And if you have any interesting bits of vintage makeup yourself, then I'd love to hear about them in the comments. Thank you so much. Take care. Bye.